clear relationship between um, both economic justice and reproductive freedom and justice, but also conversely how we think about the role of different institutional players in securing a future that um, centers public health in the experience of um, women and people who experience pregnancy as a natural part of life and something that we need to um, accommodate and prepare for and actually celebrate within our various sectors. And so we have actually um, been working with McPherson Strategy for several years now. We've been engaging in a um, long conversation with business leaders. This is one of many um, meetings. It's the first one online. We actually have been doing really fun meetings in person for a while um, to have these conversations um, and to um, you know, sort of get grounded in the facts about what is actually happening in our country and how it will affect everyone. Um, so I'm gonna spend just a minute talking about my new book, The Lie That Binds, um, because I think that it is, um, you know, I, it was a research-driven political history of how we got to where we are today. And it elicited a lot of findings for me that leads me um, to be even more invested in the conversation we're having here today. Um, and then I want to um, have a really amazing conversation with the speakers that have joined us today representing um, different elements of the business community. So um, we're going to get there in a minute, but we are joined by um, Erica Chidi, who is the founder and CEO of Loom, which you'll hear about soon. Shelly Alpern, um, who is the Director of Shareholder Advocacy for uh, RIA Ventures, and Vikram Iyer, who is the Vice President of Global Public Policy and Strategic C Communications for Postmates. So we're going to get to them in a minute. Um, you know, the book, The Lie That Binds, was actually designed to go to the heart of what we call the lie at the center of the erosion of rights in this country. And that lie, as we identified it, was the idea that the, the people who have engaged in reproductive oppression did so ever because they were driven by moral concern for outcome of individual pregnancies. In fact, there has been an architected effort, just like there has been on other rights and freedoms, um, to erode these rights of freedom and rights and freedoms as a mechanism for maintaining control, um, maintaining that kind of control that we have seen rule this country for centuries with concentrated wealth and power in the hands of a small group of individuals that are disproportionately white, disproportionately male, and um, often fundamentalists in nature. Um, that's certainly true of the current administration and who influences them. And that the result of um, that power going unchecked has actually been um, devastating in many cases to people who need access to reproductive health care at various points in, in their careers. And one of the anecdotes that I actually talk about in the book that I think is really good to sort of shape this conversation, um, you know, is um, just to table set the, the sort of fundamentalists who mobilized to political power did so in the 19 late 1960s fighting school desegregation, not fighting Roe as they would have you believe. Um, that's a bit of revisionist history. And then they joined forces with, um, with the Phyllis Schlafly and the Eagle Forum fighting the ERA, which also didn't have a lot of conversation about abortion or reproductive health care. It wasn't until much later in 1978 when they actually chose the issue of abortion as what we call a Trojan horse around which they wanted to build um, this designed society that maintained power um, and concentrated power. And um, the story that I tell, and I'm going to sort of use this as a launch pad for, for the broader conversation, is that uh, there's a lot of evidence from primary sources that, in fact, um, you know, ab abortion itself and the legalization of abortion, while individuals may have had feelings about it, was that there wasn't a lot of organized resistance. Um, but in fact, and, and in fact, like it 
sort of moved from Roe in 1973 through the rest of the 70s without much controversy, controversy and some relief because people had been suffering under a regime of illegal abortion. Um, what is less talked about is that in 1972, the Supreme Court made birth control legal for unmarried women. And that was upending society in really fundamental ways that had much more widespread effect legalization of abortion. And um, women were entering the workplace and not leaving because they were able to control their own fertility. And once they did that, they were challenging um, the hierarchy for pay equity and workplaces free of harassment and access to the C-suite. And that actually was much more challenging um, the status quo and the power of the status quo um, than Roe and what Roe sort of ushered in in terms of an era, but the people who were sort of discussing what issues that they were going to use felt like contraception was way too popular. And so they chose abortion as the tip of the spear for this um, work that they were doing. And the book lays all of that out. But the reason that I wanted to talk about that um, is threefold. One is um, at the end of the day, what we are talking about are basic values, right? Values of autonomy, values of equity, values of dignity. And that is something that I know that business has struggled with how to embrace for a very, very long time. Um, and we have got to position reproductive freedom and justice and reproductive oppression, the antithesis of reproductive freedom and justice within that values framework. Um, in order to move forward. And that's very much what the book is trying to do. The second, um, which is always shocking for people, although I know Erica and Shelley and Vikram are very familiar with this at this point, they would have you believe, the architects of the strategy would have you believe these issues are deeply controversial and not anything you wanna to touch, right? You're a business, you gotta do business things. The last thing you wanna do is annoy any of your customers. And actually, we've done extensive research that shows that the opposite is true. Um, and that, in fact, they are trying to scare and intimidate individuals, certainly in, in the context of public discourse and businesses, in staying away from something because they, they, in fact, know that these issues are very popular, that the vast majority of Americans believe that politicians have no business meddling in the personal lives of Americans, and that, in fact, they actually want businesses that incorporate these values um, and stand for them, particularly in a moment of crisis like we're experiencing. And the third thing I would say, because this is really important, I think, for the purposes of this conversation, is um, when, the, the, when we allow politicians to engage in um, the erosion, if not straight out assault on some basic fundamental rights. And again, we're not just talking about abortion, although abortion is the tip of the spear, there is a continuum. And Erica knows this better than me, of um, support that women and um, people with uteruses need um, to function in society, it falls to businesses to do that. And you guys have a choice to make because otherwise you will not be able to attract or hold valued employees who are necessary for success because what is happening is the government is taking away the things your employees need to lead the lives that allow them to participate at the table. And I don't have to tell you that when we have gender equity in business, just like when we have it in government, the outcomes are better. So I think that very much sets the table for the conversation that we are here to have today. And like I said, I don't think we could possibly have a better panel to have this conversation. I have come to know um, these folks and just really admire each and every one of them and the work that they're doing. Um, you know, it was with Vikram's help and McPherson's help that we were able to actually have so many forward thinking companies stand up in 2019 to sign the Dope Ban Equality Pledge in the wake of all of the devastating abortion bans and forced pregnancy laws that swept the country last year. Um, so we have amazing representatives who have really internalized these values 
Um, and I don't want to take up any more time because I want you to hear from them. So um, starting with Erica, why don't we actually go around and just spend one or two minutes introducing yourself to our fabulous audience today. Erica, hi. Hi, thanks for having me, Elise. It's really wonderful to be here and to have this conversation. Um, for those that don't know me, I am the co-founder and CEO of Loom. We're a well-being platform that focuses on empowering women through sexual and reproductive health education. Uh, I truly believe that health education is an underutilized healthcare intervention um, and that sexual and reproductive health for women or people that have those parts is really the mainstay and the central experience for their lives that I think for so many reasons that I won't get into because this is an intro, um, has been ignored and has been oppressed. And uh, although the focus um, very much with NARAL is the idea of protecting reproductive freedom, specifically looking or protecting more so um, abortion, I really think that abortion, miscarriage, pregnancy, fertility, periods, uh, menopause, all of these um, sexual reproductive and health experiences are on a continuum. And the more that we can center the body within the workplace, the more the workplace will become a safer place for women to exist. And I think we're in a really interesting time right now uh, within the pandemic to make space for this type of what some people might call radical change, but I just feel that it is actually just a kind of a, a long needed integration of where uh, kind of work culture needs to go. And it, just in terms of my background, I was a doula and health educator um, for about 10 years. And so uh, I've been very, very much uh, kind of fighting the fight and, um, and and doing the work for a long time. So it's wonderful to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Erica. Vikram, why don't you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about what you do? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, also, just as a quick uh, heads up, I'm in the Bay Area right now where the skies are completely um, shrouded with, with fire um, and ash. And so it's a little dark in my apartment. So my apologies that you can't see me too well. Um, but, but that aside, I am quite lit up and excited to be here as part of this book. As, as Elise pointed out, um, in the last few years, we've I've sort of felt that the private sector has more and more of a bully pulpit to stand on as you think about day-to-day -day consumers, as also movement voters or issue advocates. And by that, I mean specifically, um, I work at a company called Postmates. Some of you may be familiar with it, but if you're not, it's an app-based delivery company that right now, especially during the pandemic, um, has, has actually been utilized across all types of demographics, um, across 80% of all households in this country. We help facilitate the sales of um, oftentimes food, but also health and wellness supplies. We have about 7,000 pharmacies on the platform delivering goods and services to homebound seniors. We've been working on deliveries for FEMA, for uh, school districts that rely, or that where students rely on, on low-income school meals. And so our ability to move goods quickly within a community um, has really been a mainstay during a public health pandemic. But it has also led us to believe a, and focus on a few important facts over the last few years, even pre-COVID. Pre 60% of our customer base um, across about you know, 10 million monthly customers happen to be women. We have thousands of, of women-owned small businesses who sell goods on the platform. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have thousands of pharmacies on the platform. Um, and I sort of started to get involved in this concept to wonder one specific thing. I think it's somewhat odd for me to start this conversation by even mentioning gender numbers on the platform when we should start to normalize this uh, access to reproductive care, access to birth control. It's not a gender specific, constituency specific issue, but really something that impacts, you know, across all, all um, um, identifying natures of, of gender. Um, and then number two, trying to understand what role um, a business like mine that does have millions of active eyeballs within its app on a daily basis, how we can start to normalize this as an issue that goes beyond just this divisive lightning rod. And for us as a, as a company, we started to notice that a few women-owned businesses um, in southern states, states that have tried to decriminalize, or sorry, criminalize and penalize access to reproductive care, 
act actually needed to turn their services offline just so that way they or their staffs could go and seek reproductive care in another state. And that instantly impacts our business and our ability to serve goods in the community. So um, Postmates has been trying to think and get smarter. We're certainly no issue experts on this topic and we take our guidance from, from NARAL and other coalition partners, but how can we normalize and how can we elevate this issue as an also an economic issue has been where we've been spending much of our time. And so we're, we're proud and excited to be here with you today, Elise. Thank you so much, Vikram. And Shelly, um, tell us about yourself and Rhea Ventures. Sure, thanks, Elise. Um, Rhea Ventures is a nonprofit and our mission is to harness the uh, new capital and the power of the markets to improve the quality of women's reproductive health and um, maternal health. We use a range of tools, um, impact investing funds, collaborative grant making, shareholder advocacy, uh, to bring together investors uh, who are sometimes foundations, uh, but other institutional individual investors, entrepreneurs uh, and companies to fund science, to capitalize innovative technologies, um, and to promote policies that will improve women's reproductive lives. Um, so what I do is direct our shareholder advocacy activities. And this means mobilizing institutional investors to engage with companies uh, that they hold in their portfolios to advocate for improved corporate policies around reproductive health. So uh, I work to facilitate dialogues between uh, these investors who are a, a large and diverse group um, uh, with companies, um, large companies, publicly traded ones, who have the ability to make a positive difference when it comes to insurance benefits, uh, public policy, and political spending. Um, the focus, this focus on large companies uh, in our economy complements RIA's core work of driving more capital towards newer and smaller companies uh, who are trying to bring reproductive and maternal health solutions to the market. Fantastic. So as you guys can see, it's an incredible group of panelists. So I'm going to um, kick off with some questions and then we are going to get to audience question and answer towards the end of the call. So um, if you've got them, go ahead and drop them in the chat um, uh, so you don't forget them because um, we have these amazing experts. So um, Erica, let me start with you because you have really built this company from the ground up and the values were, you and I talked about this last week, the values were so central to um, your concept and vision of the company. You know, I think um, one of the things that I would love to hear you talk about is um, the idea that like gender and racial inclusivity are so top of mind right now. They're top of mind for everybody, including companies. Um, how do you think about the way that we connect reproductive health and reproductive oppression to people who are more comfortable with those sort of topics of, of gender and racial inclusion and making sure that they understand the integral nature? So it's an interest, that's a really great question and I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to try and answer Kind of both parts of it. I think in terms of Loom, you know, we are a, you know, we're about three years old, recently um, became venture backed, moving from a in person brick and mortar education experience to a digital or building a digital product right now. So I think what's really wonderful and also complicated trying to scale a business inside of a pandemic is that the pandemic created this you know, kind of upending of the, of our world as we know it, and also created this, you know, uh, kind of racial awakening for people. And so as we are building both our internal culture and our kind of external messaging, uh, building in uh, anti-racist, uh, you know, uh, languaging and really highlighting and bringing people's awareness to concepts like reproductive justice, which for most people, there's not a lot of awareness around that, that, that concept or that framework. Um, there tends to be more awareness around reproductive rights, which is very much more a kind of dominant culture uh, narrative around um, reproductive protections or reproductive um, autonomy. It's very much about the right to choose around pregnancy, whereas reproductive justice really is around the right to have a child safely or to choose not to have a child safely. It's also about um, centering BIPOC 
people. It's also about the socio and economic components that either um, create barriers or um, create access to care. Uh, and, and really looking at the full expanse of um, a person's experience and how it connects to their reproductive health um, journey. And so what's interesting, and we said, I said this to you on, our, on the call that we had is, uh, you know, Loom is a B corporation. We're on our way to becoming a benefit corporation, but we are also a venture-backed for-profit reproductive justice um, company, which is very odd. There's not a lot of RJ, reproductive justice, within a for-profit environment. So, you know, uh, we're working really hard to figure out, you know, uh, how to really scale impact impact and scale profit profitability in a parallel timeline, um, which is, again, kind of an unusual uh, trajectory, but it's, but it's really necessary. And so, you know, also the other component is, you know, as a Black CEO, Black female, gay CEO, um, you know, that in itself is, is impact by osmosis, right? Um, being able to, you know, stand, stand, beside or in front of the company and be able to talk about, um, you know, racism and also talk about the issues that are important, I think is one of the ways that we're able to kind of couple, you know, our, our value proposition as a company, but then also create this awareness that, you know, these are the things that need to change and this, and this is how we can kind of begin to do it. Um, I think what's really inspiring, um, you know, for me right now, and also just hearing a little bit about Bikram and, and thinking about what Postmates is doing, and I think I heard a very similar thing kind of happening at Nextdoor, these companies that have a lot of deep access to, um, you know, most of the country, is that there is this opportunity right now to um, really reimagine how Cult, company culture works and, and, and what are the things that we care about. And for me, really with Loom, and it's been interesting because I've been, you know, talking to a couple of different companies right now, just doing a bit of um, kind of, you know, culture advising, well-being advising. And, you know, women's bodies are their whole experience. It, trying to separate the two is very much a patriarchal concept and it doesn't really serve women at all. And so the fact that now we wake up at work, or as one of my investors said the other day, we are living at work. Um, we now need to figure out how to really prioritize and center the body as a place of, as, as a thing that needs maintenance and support, just like the way you would any other component of your, of your work life. So I think reproductive health, not just as an insurance benefit, but actually figuring out how to create uh, a culture of what I, a term I've come up with called biological empathy, where within the workplace there is um, empathy from women and from allies of women, co-conspirators of women, um, to make space for the sensitivities and the unique kind of invisible obstacles that they experience in their bodies that can impact their work, even though that other woman or ally, man, cis person, has no experience of whatever the particular reproductive issue is, um, but they, through education and awareness, they're able to be empathetic and be able to make, you know, whatever subtle tweaks need to happen around productivity, et cetera, um, timelines um, in order to make space for that. Just the way you would if someone needed to take a mental health day. Um, I think there needs to be an exploration of what it looks like for women or people that have those parts to take a reproductive health day, um, whether that's related to, you know, coming back to work after postpartum or going through peri perimenopause or menopause um, or having a heavy period or endometriosis, any of those things. Um, I think this idea of invisible obstacles, biological empathy, and then coupled in this work culture now that is also exploring anti-racism and DNI at a very kind of intensive level, I think there's room to also prioritize kind of reproductive health education um, for the betterment of work culture at large, in my opinion. Amazing. I mean, I just am so in awe of what Loom is doing. And Eric and I have talked about this because I think it's really um, centering a continuum of experience that, uh, as I told you on our call last week, feels really isolating if you're just going through it alone, um, which is amazing. Um, so thank you. 
Um, Vikram, you guys are kind of the opposite of Loom, right? You got in, you had a product, it was really working for people. Nothing required you to actually step up and stand out on this issue or any of the issues. So um, tell us why Postmates chose to engage, particularly but not exclusively, on the dumb ban equality work um, and, you know, how that sort of like runs through your business and then what the response was, what the customer response was. First of all, Eric, I have to say this notion of biological um, empathy is, is a phenomenal frame and a really important summation of, of where I think we start the first part of the answer to Lisa's question, which is just, um, there's sort of a, there's an economics aspect to this at least, but there's also just like a straight up values perspective. And from a values perspective, we felt, uh, particularly as um, certain states started to criminalize just access to care and make an injustice out of reproductive justice, um, we were deeply concerned because if you think about it, we are a digital app. You press a few buttons, you get goods delivered to your door, but we operate in an analog world, meaning that the service is someone who's picking up goods from a local restaurant or a local merchant. That merchant, he, um, him or herself, may be actually a Muslim American, that courier picking up those goods could be a former vet, and that, that goods might be dropped off to your neighbor, um, maybe a neighbor that, that is seeking reproductive care in their own right. Those are three very specific profiles of people. But they're all in our communities. They're all our neighbors. And so our marketplace that is connecting couriers to local goods and local businesses owned by local neighbors to your own neighbor in your apartment building or in your home means that our platform only thrives if everyone in that three-sided ex transaction or exchange can feel safe, frankly, in their own skin and can have some sense of vitality in their own livelihoods. So in the past, that's actually meant we've stood up for things like immigration reform and pushing back on the travel ban. That's meant we've, we've stood up for, or stood up against gun violence in communities that could take place at any of these local retailers. And of course, it's meant that if we are actively discouraging the health and well-being of workers on our platform or business owners on our platform or the customers on our platform with backwards reproductive laws, then we've got a real risk to the business. So on the one side, it is about wanting to stand on the right side of history. But on another practical side, it is about the economics of our marketplace just continuing. And I hate to just be the business person that speaks to like, well, money's on the line. But I, I started to think that maybe that was an important marker to put out there because for those that are um, you know, fellow business owners or leaders like Erica or Shelly or others, the more that we have this conversation outside of the frame of just a matter of physiology or just a matter of values and politics, the more that you can have access to this topic from different corners of just ideological perspectives. And so we thought the New York Times push on don't ban equality was an important first step to just, you know, really seize and grab the, the imagination of the, the nation. We also at least have partnered with your colleagues over at Plan for um, Planned Parenthood to join the um, Business Council for Birth Control because, as I mentioned, we have thousands of pharmacies on our platform, and actually, num the, one of the number one selling products on the Postmates app, even though I typically use it to get burritos delivered to my house, is actually birth control being delivered through delivery on the app. Um, and it's also kind of animated our interest in if there's a future uh, administration change or there's new dynamic to the House and Senate, then what do conversations around the Hyde Amendment look like when it comes to just reproductive rights as part of foreign policy in this country? And so there's a lot of different vectors in which we can think about it, but at least, you know, to your point about when we started leaning in by working with you and the ACLU and PPFA in terms of standing up for not banning equality, um, we, I kept wondering what the pushback would be, um, both internally with employees and externally with customers. And internally, for any of those that you, of you out there that happen to work at businesses in which you want to push your business or your executives to take a stance, but you're not sure where to start, I have to say it just is going to start with you being a change agent. Um, we've got a very tech forward culture. So there are communications channels inside of our company like Slack or other messaging services. And so just by pushing out a platform, an anonymous platform, before we took that pledge release, we actually asked our colleagues, 1300 of them, what would you think of us as a business taking a stance on an issue we typically have not in the past? And the response was overwhelmingly positive across people that live really across the country. Um, but then when we went live with it on the customer side, Yes, of course, we got some trolls on Twitter 
um, that said, you know, stay out of, of these issues. Your, your job is to bring me my food and to, you know, deliver a core service of just delivery in my neighborhood. But after just a couple of hours, I would say, not even a couple of days, that tone petered out. And the support for a company leaning in really just stayed and remained. And, and since that point, when we have weighed in on other issues um, germane to reproductive justice, but even other topics, we haven't actually received a lot of pushback. And I think that's a really important reminder because while Postmates may not be a household name everywhere in the country, consumers have purchasing power. They could easily flock to our competitors like at DoorDash or at you know, Instacart or Uber Eats. Um, but those that remain uh, loyal to the platform are only choosing to do so because I think consumer purchasing power matters a lot these days. And if you can justify um, getting that, you know, two burgers delivered on a lazy Sunday because that company also happens to be standing up for values you identify in, then we think that there's upside there as a business as well. But um, I'll just wrap by saying that the, this notion of, of customers taking a company hostage in terms of their use of it because of a stance that they take I think is a bit more of a myth than fact when we've taken pretty um, um, bold stances in the last year and a half at, at the leadership and direction in partnership with NARAL. And I'll, I'll, I've had a colleague who, who has my job at another company that was planning on taking um, a stance on something similar, a little bit of a different issue, but it was the first time they'd ever taken a stance before as a company on a civic matter. And they were really, really nervous about how customers would push back and ultimately, they didn't actually see that response. Now, I don't want to say that's going to be equal across every company, but I think that we all owe it to ourselves to understand, can we dip our toe in the water to start pushing for a conversation? And to Erica's point, not just have these as benefits on, the, on an employer's payroll, but really raise the level of debate in this country. And if we've upset anyone along the way, at worst, we've had a dialogue. And I think that's more important than sitting on the sidelines. So great, thank you, Vikram. And and certainly the polling we did uh, work with Harris Research bears out Vikram's experience that the majority of people not only support um, access to reproductive health care and um, the values beyond behind reproductive freedom and justice, but in fact, consumers really I think um, are increasingly interested in companies taking a stance because we are so under attack in this country from the minority. Um, so Shelly, I mean, Rhea actually wrote the business case for reproductive health. So, um, you know, you're speaking at a sort of like, you have a vantage point that spans many businesses. So tell us a little bit about um, the report that you issued and the top line insights and um, maybe some examples of companies you work with. I know you may not want to use names, but that have taken specific actions that we can learn from. Sure, so uh, yeah, we commissioned the business case uh, last, about last year at this time, and it was completed in December, launched in January. Um, so uh, a lot of our figures are you know, pre-pandemic, but uh, even so, I think that a lot of business case arguments really uh, hold up remarkably well. Um, we talked to a number of companies and we did talk to them uh, in confidence, so, uh, so I can't, uh, tie specific companies to, to specific policies in most cases. Um, we also uh, were uh, benefited by a uh, survey that was um, commissioned by Terra Health in December of last year. Uh, they uh, um, polled a thousand college educated women um, for uh, on a lot of questions related to reproductive health coverage. And so I'll be uh, telling you about some of those results. Um, we had five major takeaways from this uh, report. And the first um, is that reproductive health care is, um, from the corporate perspective, it's um, essential to developing a lar the larger talent pool from which you would draw employees. Um, the survey that I just mentioned found that a majority of college edu educated women wouldn't even apply to a job in a state that had recently banned abortion. Um, and that's, of course, not good news for the many Fortune 500 companies that are headquartered in Georgia and Texas, for example. Um, of course, um, you know, without reproductive health care, uh, the choice of whether or not to work just simply evaporates. Um, and women know this. Um, you know, before the pandemic, surveys showed that uh, nearly nine in 10 women said that controlling if and when to have children has been important to their careers. Um, that's, uh, you know, got to be, if you took that survey again, even more important now. Um, uh, if, if uh, you know, given how hard it is to um, to juggle uh, 
children uh, schooling at home and your job at the same time. Um, and that, you know, that is actually uh, reflected in a, uh, a May survey that was done by Guggenmacher showed that indeed about a third of women said that they wanted to uh, delay child rearing or have fewer children um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, so, uh, you know, whether, well, we're bringing this information to companies when we dialogue with them, but whether or not they have seen this st these statistics, um, I'm sure they, they resonate with uh, the, you know, the corporate experience right now. Um, because of the, the questions about the, you know, the linkage between reproductive health care and the larger talent pool, we encourage companies to get active on public policy. Um, to strengthen uh, access to reproductive health care for all women, not just their current employees. The second uh, major uh, uh, takeaway um, is that, uh, you know, uh, reproductive health care uh, is, um, you know, quality health care uh, is really essential for retaining the talent that you already have within your company. Um, you know, again, the, the point I made about, um, you know, nearly nine in 10 women uh, of this being of paramount importance to them. Um, it's having uh, insurance is um, in demand and high demand from women. 83% of women of reproductive age uh, said that they would want their employees insurance to cover uh, the full range of reproductive health care, including abortion. Um, again, you know, going back to your central thesis, uh, Elise, that um, this is not controversial. Um, the third takeaway is that reproductive health care is inexpensive relative to overall health costs. Um, the, in the companies we spoke to, none of the uh, companies that were uh, doing uh, innovative or you know, uh, generous uh, policies in this area uh, cited cost as a factor. And you can also see that in the, uh, the trend toward offering fertility treatments, which are, um, you know, relatively expensive. Um, and although I would, I would expect that fertility treatments might have, the, the growth rate of them might have slowed down, um, you know, given economic pressures now, but I haven't seen any uh, figures to back that up. Um, the fourth major takeaway, um, which you know, we've already talked about is that um, reproductive health care is essential for companies to, uh, uh, who are trying to meet diversity and inclusion goals. And of course, the pandemic is having a disproportionate negative impact on women and people of color. Uh, there's going to need to be a whole suite of policies to correct for that, from paid family leave that includes paternal leave, for example, um, giving part-time workers more control over flexible hours, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and reproductive health care uh, you know, is an essential part of that suite of, of corrective measures that needs to happen. Uh, and because of uh, economic, uh, the economic pressures on companies right now, it's something that uh, government is just simply going to have to get behind. Um, so uh, the fifth and the final takeaway, top line takeaway from the report uh, is that um, uh, more and more corporate stakeholders are looking at the corporate role in reproductive health care and companies need to prepare for the scrutiny. Um, so we work with investors. We're, you know, we're putting pressure on companies from that angle. Uh, consumers are paying attention. Uh, uh, consumer watchdog groups are paying attention, and so is the media. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll I'll stop there. There's uh, we could get into a lot more depth, but um, those are the five major takeaways. Awesome. Thank you, Shelley. So helpful. So um, an amazing array of expertise. Um, and I have a couple questions for all of you to weigh in on. And then remember, if you have questions um, as the audience, drop them in the chat. We're going to be getting to them really soon. Um, I would say that, um, you know, sometimes what I hear from people is that the hardest part is starting the conversation. So um, that's probably true for people uh, you know, starting businesses like Erica with investors, that's probably true uh, for you know, uh, people like Shelly with you, you deal with investors at a different class. So how um, would you encourage people on the call to think about initiating the conversation um, from you know, both from a business and a values perspective, but um, just how do, you, how do you start? How did you guys start? You're asking all of us? Yeah, I think you all have like unique perspectives on this and it's worth hearing from all of you. Uh, 
I'm happy to go first. Um, well, you know, we really developed the business case, uh, Hidden Value, to be a tool, uh, to be a conversation starter. So I would uh, really encourage um, folks listening in on the call that if you want to approach a business, uh, take a look at it. Um, and, uh, you know, there's an executive summary that neatly, more neatly than I did, summarizes up all the, the major takeaways. Um, use it, uh, present it to companies, um, and use it as a conversation starter. Uh, we also want to get this uh, in front of um, policymakers as well. Um, but uh, but it's it does um, it really tries to get into to answer the questions that business are considering, um, uh, which is what's the cost to me if I want to go out on a limb on this um, from a financial perspective and from a reputation perspective. Well, what do I have to gain? Um, so, uh, so please use our tool. <laughs> Erica? You know, I think a couple of things, but I, just to be succinct, in terms of just getting people, you know, activated or aligned around, um, you know, our, our, our value set, as someone who worked in reproductive health for such a long time, I, the business was built with that inside of it, really. And I think that, you know, I, I, I've never really thought about building a business in any other way, you know? So I, it's, it's kind of a, I, I'm trying to see if I can say something smart about it, but I, I, I think I have the benefit of not having to dilute the vision and the, and, and the need set of the business because I, I basically got to expand on the work that I was doing. So I don't know if that if that kind of answers the question to some set, but it, it it's just really baked into the foundation of what we're doing. That's great, Vikram. Yeah, I would. Um, you know, as someone that that doesn't benefit from like Erica's background and expertise, for example, I, I think one thing that we all find ourselves doing these days, regardless of your political persuasion, and, and not that this is a political issue, but is I, I find neighbors and family members and, and those that have not worked on, on um, issues of public interest uh, to just be more civically activated these days. Um, I think it, it could be a function of our times. It could be a function of, of the last year alone and, and all of the twists and turns that we've seen within it. But I think that's, that's an important hook for anyone wanting to have that conversation either at the dinner table or within their business, because it's not lost on any executive, certainly not a, a tech executive these days, um, where our hook has been that technology companies um, for, for a number of years have been seen as um, really interesting tools to help advance some sort of um, human need or human interest. But of late, those technology companies have had a, a fair bit of, of um, of regulatory questions and a lot more of our elected leaders are questioning sort of the, the scope and reach of some of these companies. So if you combine, just from the Postmates example, you combine this, this more civically activated customer base or citizenry, and you combine this notion that more and more technology companies are interested in being good stewards of, of values and representing what could be good for the communities they occupy, not just selling their product. That sort of softens the ground in a major, major way um, for this to go from just like a, a, an academic or intellectual sideshow for a company whose core product doesn't touch healthcare, so to speak, um, to one in which you can really capture the attention of both your colleagues and fellow employees or executives within the company. Two tools to just be mindful about how to start that conversation. I think um, a lot of different businesses out there, regardless of your sector, might have employee resource groups. Um, my organization, when I started a few years ago, did not. And so I think self-organizing and sort of just finding other like-minded individuals and those that disagree with you within the, in the organization that you're in might just be a healthy way to start having a dialogue or a debate. And then the second tool I would think about um, is really trying your best to, to talk to other companies about how they went from zero advocacy on an issue to a little bit more developed advocacy. Who are the third party stakeholders they talk to? How did they measure any backlash or risk to the business? Um, and I'm sure all of us would love to share that, myself included, and, and I can um, uh, share my email address in, in, this, in the chat if that's helpful, but I think starting that dialogue with your peers and then starting that dialogue within companies with your executives is, is the right way to do it, and it often just starts with a cold email. That's awesome. Oh, go ahead, Shelly. 
Thank you. Yeah, if I could add, you know, one more one more point. Um, we shouldn't assume that um, you know bringing the business case for reproductive health to companies is going to be uh, hard to swallow or you know unwelcome news. Um, we've had uh, conversations with maybe a dozen companies at this point, and these are you know very large publicly traded companies, and um, you know some of them we had to like you know pers we had to chase to have those conversations. Um, and found, but we did find ourselves pleasantly surprised and they, I think, found themselves pleasantly surprised that uh, by what they were hearing, that there is such a strong business case um, and that they have so much to gain from um, being good actors in this regard. I, I mean, they, some of them really seem grateful for the information and we've often been pleased um, by what we're hearing from them. That, uh, you know, a number of the companies we're talking to go, for example, beyond the Affordable Care Act in terms of uh, the uh, range of contraception that they will ensure. And also just to um, piggyback on what Shelly shared, um, you know, I just did uh, a, basically a kind of a workshop for um, a leadership team at, at Lululemon who are obviously super focused on anything to do kind of like with, with the body and, and all of that, but they're really leaning into wanting to support um, their teams around reproductive health and not just, as I was saying, as a benefit for, with your insurance, but actually how do we start to shift the actual culture um, and be able to create an environment that um, is safer and able to kind of hold dialogue and conversation around um, some of these reproductive um, health inflection points and challenges that um, that team members might experience. And so um, just to Shelley's point, it's actually, I think that the the interest is really there. It's more just creating these opportunities, um, you know, to to kind of act on that interest. I love everything that you guys are saying. Obviously, that's what we, you know, it's it tracks so closely with what we've experienced as people who also engage with um, voters across the board, right? Like. The interest is there <laughs> and it's actually, we write about this in the book, it's been our sort of um, willing silence in the space that has allowed a minority to dictate um, the experience of so many. Um, so anybody on the call who has a question, um, I think I see what, oh, no, just a shout out to Ria from Natalie Molina Nino. Um, you've been a great partner. Um, anyone who has a question, go for it in the chat. And while we're waiting, I will ask um, one more. You know, um, one of the things that Eric and I talked about last time we spoke, which we haven't talked about a lot on this phone, um, on, on the Zoom, but I think we're sort of talking about um, in the background is levels of advocacy, right? So um, businesses who step out and sign an ad as a level of advocacy. Shelly, you talked about shareholder advocacy. Erica, you and I talked about um, how it's baked into your business to actually help people become advocates within their own businesses, but also on public policy, right? And um, so where do you guys think advocacy on this is going? And I will just say as someone um, who, work, who has worked on other issues in my time and advocacy, um, are we looking at something like a wave of advocacy from both consumers and businesses um, on reproductive health, freedom and justice, the way we've seen on climate change, for example, many years ago? Um, and, uh, you know, what, what do you see on the horizon and how can people on this call kind of hasten um, what, what we're, what the coming of what we want to see, I guess? I think we are looking at a new wave of advocacy. Um, I have I've seen it really take off after the uh, last spring's uh, wave of um, heartbeat bills in the states, uh, and and in the way that the uh, you know the blowback to that. Uh, I saw, saw groups and individuals and, uh, you know, stakeholder groups sort of entering the conversation on this that I hadn't seen before. I saw a focus from the uh, media on um, the companies in these states and how the company political contributions had been going to uh, recipients who are enemies of access to reproductive health care. 
uh, that's what I meant earlier when I was talking about uh, how one of our top takeaways is that there's increased scrutiny on the on the corporate role. Um, you know, um, sometimes that corporate role isn't even intentional, but it's still there. It has to be teased out. It has to be, you know, reoriented. Um, and uh, I uh, also, um, you know, with uh, the two, um, you know, I think we everyone breathed breathed a sigh of relief when the uh, when this particular court uh, term didn't do us any uh, uh, sort of uh, body blows on the um, at least yet on the uh, uh, the two cases in front of it around abortion and contraception, um, but there was a uh, you know again um, mobilization around that uh, uh, and I, but we still think we're all bracing uh, and and talking offline, uh, you know, getting coalitions together to make sure that, you know, every stakeholder group with an interest in, in this is um, uh, going to make noise. Yeah, and I agree. I think that we definitely are um, coming up on a new wave of advocacy um, around sexual and reproductive health in general. Um, advocacy in a macro sense in terms of, you know, policy change and movement voting um, and all of that. But then I think also advocacy on a micro level um, through uh, upskilling um, and continuing education around sexual reproductive health, um, both for women who have been, you know, denied access to that information due to stigma and shame and um, you know, and, and religion and patriarchal concepts and constructs. Um, and then also for allies of women, cis men um, and, and, and the like that want to learn about reproductive health and sexual health to be able to be better allies and to help um, use their, uh, use their, their position to, to soften the environment um, for the women that work inside of it. Um, and I think that that's really key and that's really just more in the kind of the adult arena, but I think the same um, revolution is going to be required in the educational arena, especially with now homeschooling potentially being um, home online schooling being the, 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 the long haul, um, you know, how do we, how do we solve for uh, you know, you, puberty at home when parents are now kind of the primary educators, there's going to be this desire to figure out how do we, so, so just to, to be more succinct, I, again, as I said at the top of this um, call, I think that education is an underutilized healthcare intervention and it's a new area of advocacy, the actual learning um, to be able to be a more, uh, you know, uh, like have a more rigorous participation in like what is happening in the world. And I think the pandemic has pushed people back into their bodies in a way that was, that was very reactive. But I think the more that we think about our health and well-being, um, this kind of reproductive, uh, you know, uh, advocacy and just an interest is only going to, to, to grow. Yeah, I, I think, um, there's like four broad strokes I think about this in. One sort of piggybacks off of what um, uh, Erica said about allies, but I think we're, we're seeing this era of employee activists, um, not necessarily as a reason for a company to take a stance for reproductive justice, but just for demands for um, uh, pay equity within businesses, expanded access to paid leave within businesses. And so I think we're going to see more and more of this um, in, in maybe larger companies to start, but hopefully sm small ones alike to nudge employers to start thinking about their looking at themselves in the mirror and starting to reform policies that reflect the justice that we're talking about on this call. The second area um, is is kind of broadly when we think about new workforce models. You know, I work in the gig economy. There's a lot of debate about how workers are protected there. Um, others that maybe address advanced technologies like new manufacturing or automation or AI. Seems like every two weeks there's a McKinsey or Bain report about how work is changing. But I think with that change comes a new articulation of benefits and what a safety net should look like for the future of work in this country and others. And I, and I hope that this continues to be a push that when we think about new workforce models, we're also thinking about the access to the benefits underneath the hood of that model. The, the third thing I would say is kind of what Shelley spoke to 
which are more organizations that want to be serious about seeking change here. I hate to admit it, but we're going to need to start investing in, in candidates and issue campaigns up and down the ballot to really change the political makeup of, of this country. Um, and that also follows suit with jurists and who ends, ends up on benches um, on the appellate level and certainly on the national level. And then the fourth and final thing, and I, and I hate to say this because I always, I still think that I'm just a young kid in the grand scheme of things, but I think this next generation of activists that we see on full display across climate issues, gun violence issues, um, racial equity and black equity issues, um, are, they are something to watch in this overall conversation. And, and I hope that at a minimum, that level of, of passion and momentum that, that's being driven from, from younger students in America um, is a sense of optimism that we can all not hang our hat on and say that the work is done, we'll pass the baton, but certainly can be part of this broader movement as well. You guys are just amazing. Um, last chance for questions. Seeing none, um, I am going to give you guys one lot, like your final word, whatever you want the audience to walk away with. But I'm going to ask one thing, which is, um, you know, I'm an advocate. NARAL loves what you guys do. I'm sure there are lots of people on the phone um, who love what you guys are doing and what you've like conceived of and stepped out on. Um, if there is one thing allies and people who want to see you succeed do to help you, um, what would that be? Whoever wants to go first. Final words. All right. <laughs> I don't want there to be any awkward silences. <laughs> um, well, okay, so I'm in the business of mobilizing investors um, and you know, whether you've thought about it or not, and when listening to this call, you will probably um, have some either first or second degree relationship with some kind of institutional investor, um, whether it's, um, you know, a, uh, um, some kind of uh, foundation that you're, uh, that you have a relationship with, um, or, uh, you know, uh, a university endowment, uh, a public pension fund, uh, any kind of institutional investor. Uh, we uh, are always seeking to have uh, companies, uh, institutional investors, that is, sign on to our letters to companies. Doesn't obligate the those who sign on to uh, take part in the dialogue with companies, but um, it really helps us get an audience with companies when we can show that there's a whole big group of institutional investors uh, that care about the issue. So. Um, uh, it, please be thinking about that if you want to see investors succeed in our mission here. Um, again, um, take our business case and fling it far and wide. Um, help us get it into the hands of employees, uh, investors, uh, anybody who works at a company at any level. Um, that would that would be great. Um, and I am probably forgetting something, but I'll cede my I'll hand the mic over. Great. Erica, what can we do to support you? Sign up at loomhq.com. I already did, so definitely do that. Yeah, you know, we are at the seed stage of our business and we are um, going to be launching our, our beta at the top of the year. So for us right now, it's really just, um, you know, gathering, uh, gathering as much support as we can for when, when, when that launch happens. And uh, I think that would be the easiest, the easiest ask right now. Awesome. Vikram? I think just making sure that, that given that I'm at a business, that, that if you're a consumer or a customer, um, that you're kind of targeting your, your consumer dollars to the companies that maybe reflect your values. And even though one transaction may not seem like it can create legislative reforms in this country, I think they, they give companies like ours and other peers and competitors the courage to, to be uh, mindful of, of where you want to spend based off of your values. Wonderful comments, wonderful panelists. And let me just say, as someone who has studied how um, a minority has hijacked what the majority wants in this country, and that's true in politics, it's true in business, and it's true in our culture generally, um, I would add like definitely frequent businesses that share your values, but say thank you, right? Like the world we live in means that businesses hear complaints far more than they hear thank you. So if you see a company stepping out on this, if you see a company like Loom that has totally internalized this, 
just say thank you, say it on Twitter, say it on social media platforms, invite your friends to frequent those companies and say why. Um, otherwise we get drowned out by a very noisy minority. So thank you all for joining today. Thank you to Erica, Shelley, and Vikram for all you do and all your wisdom. <coughs> and thank you to McPherson Strategies for organizing. It's been a real honor to be with you guys today. Thank you. 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 Thank you.